Chef's Day Plant International, they're privately owned mineral aggregates contractor with over 50 years experience within the plant industry and pride themselves on being able to provide sustainable and practical solutions for resource extraction whilst maintaining health and safety to the highest standards. We're fortunate to be joined today by Ian Ormrod, General Manager, and Ross Hayward, Head of Assets and Commercial. Ian has 20 years experience working in the quarrying industry, starting as a trainee shop fire and then working in a succession of supervisory and management roles up to the current level of General Manager. He has worked across multiple uh, disciplines covering hard rock, sand and gravel, asphalt manufacture, recycling, landfill, as well as having commercial roles. Uh, currently responsible for the safe and efficient deployment of Chepstow Plant's 400 frontline assets covering direct hire to clients as well as subcontracted operations. Ross has nearly a decade's worth of experience working within the minerals and aggregate sector, specialising in quarrying and mining. His areas of expertise are asset and risk management, customer relations and sales, with a passion for identifying, analysing and continually pursuing efficiency gains, whether it's through asset lifecycle optimization, improved fuel performance or asset optimization within site operations. So I hand over to Ross, who I believe is going to be starting their presentation of this afternoon. Good um, afternoon, everyone. Firstly, thanks for your time this afternoon. Thanks to the IAQ and the IAT for giving us this opportunity to present you all part of the Approaching Net Zero Conference Week. So our presentation today will aim to cover three core areas. Brief instructions, chapter plan for those who don't know us, and some of the tools we use today for sustainable operations. How this looks in real life through three different case studies, all across different applications with a focus of machine, man and application. And then finally, what options are available to all of us today with a look ahead to development for tomorrow. As mentioned, first section covers a bit about us and how we're trying to push ourselves closer to net zero and a sustainable future using what we have today. So for those who don't know about Chester Plant, we've been operating in the mineral extractive sector for over 25 years, specialising in quarrying, earth moving and material handling. More recently, we've also focused on fleet managed services with Evo Fleet. As a business, we move circa 25 million tonnes a year, operate around 400 machines in our fleet, and employing around 250 people. As a business, we invest heavily in our contracting fleet, over 75 million invested since 2018, with over 70% of our core fleet now run on tier five engines. At Chester Plant, we have a strong history on development. In recent years, it's been heavily focused on HSC and operators with projects such as Project Fusion and our ABT Inconometer Stability. Moving forwards, there's a concentrated focus towards sustainability and net zero through technology. For us, this is the logical next step, expanding on the perception of competent and the key target is interdependent employee behaviour, which doesn't just encompass safety, it looks at development, our operators, and importantly at the moment, sustainability. So what areas can we focus on? These four areas are our starting point. Each time you visit a site or a scenario, asset performance, etc. It's important to probably say right from the outset that all these tools are available to everyone within our industry. For us, it's our focus on man, machine and application along our training department, which help us apply these tools. But for us at the moment, these four areas are perhaps best seen and realised through Evo Fleet, where we work with our customers on long-term goals and the same shared mutual objectives, whether it's operator safety or now more recently sustainability. These tools centre around our key philosophy of marginal aggregated gains whereby we search for data anomalies or performance improvement possibilities to look for these one to two percent improvements. So it could be as simple as reconfigure an excavator bucket to maximize each pass. But check the plant though, in terms of sustainability, these improvements lie within tier five engines, advanced systems such as Hall Assist, large scale data analytics, operator training and optimal asset configurations. Perhaps a little bit smaller or something a little bit less. We even look at the carbon footprint through using remolded tyres on our dump trucks. All of these gains or improvements are driven by our data and our analysis. Each of these four areas then help, help us push closer to net zero through improved efficiencies, reduced fuel burn, and ultimately less pollutants. My colleague Ian will now run through some of the case studies showing these tools in real life scenarios. 
Thanks, Ross. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, hopefully I've picked out three case studies that will uh, show ways in which we can all today make uh, improvements to our operations, both in terms of productivity, but uh, more sustainably in terms of reducing fuel burn, particularly with fuel being a cost that's set to increase markedly next year. So the first example is for a, a KLM mine down in the southwest of England, where Chepstow Clark provide 25 machines for use in a, in a large scale mining operation as part of our Evo fleet offering. This fleet is made up of excavators, dump trucks, wheel loaders and bulldozers. So looking at engine modes, we supply three 75 tonne excavators to this site for use as prime movers loading a fleet of dump trucks. Collectively, they move about 6 million tonnes per year over 3,200 working hours. The machines are all Volvo EC750 excavators purchased in 2019 and come with a number of power mode settings. Each mode has a fuel demand to give it the power it requires. The machine telemetry we have available to us shows us the fuel demand of each power mode and the percentage split of how the driver is selecting these modes. As you can see from the chart on screen, the operators are continually using the power and heavy modes, which have the highest fuel burn rates. These higher fuel power modes burn double the amount of fuel as when using the general dig mode. As prime movers working on a granite blast pile, we have to accept that sometimes the operator will need more power if the blast pile is tight or poorly fragmented. But a lot of the time the machine is loading loose material well within the machine's comfortable working envelope. So we found our machines burn on average 53 litres per hour. But if we could get these machines to spend 50% of their time working in general dig mode, that would reduce the overall fuel burn down to 39 litres an hour. Now this might seem like wishful thinking, but as you'll see later, we do have 70 tonne excavators working in rock quarries only using 40 litres per hour. So with these excavators, we also supply 17 40 tonne Volvo A40G dump trucks. Now, during the same exercise, we reviewed dump truck fuel usage and found a 10% variation across the fleet. The telemetry showed the differences in driving style were the largest influence being made by the drivers, in particular the use of the mechanical foot brake over the retarder. We created a toolbox talk on the subject supported by coaching sessions with one of our in-house plant trainers. And from these discussions, we found that several of the drivers were not confident in using the new style of automatic engine retarders that the truck, the truck needs to pick up a bit of speed when moving downhill before it kicks in. And this is very different to the driver's experience with the older style manual retarder controls where the driver had full control over the process. And now this training has produced a 9% saving in fuel burn across the ADT fleet. I hope not all of it was from the highest fuel users coming down to the level of the lowest users, but actually all of the drivers showed an improvement in their fuel burn following the one-to-one -one coaching. Now, the last element in this case study is the three, three wheel loaders we deployed to work with the monitor hoses when separating the kaolin clay from the host rock. These machines work 20 hours per day, seven days a week, and so rack up a lot of working hours and use a lot of fuel. When replacing these machines, we work with our client to source machines that would lower the operating costs, principally through fuel usage while not compromising on productivity. Now, the CAT 972XC model as uh, shown in the uh, information below, replaced a like-for-like -like CAT 972M, but with the hydrostatic drive system, reduced fuel burn by 29%. This was the first to be replaced in early 2019 and is due for renewal early next year. Most importantly, this machine has consistently delivered this low fuel use all the time it's been working. Now, the Libre 580 and 576 X power models replaced the CAT 980 and Komatsu WA 480 respectively, and have been operating for the last few months. As with the CAT 972, both machines have shown impressive fuel burn reductions compared with their predecessors while working in the same environment with the same operators. So to put this in a little bit of context, the three excavators we're currently working, we've had the potential to save 135,000 litres a year. The 17 40 tonne AGTs to save 100,000 litres a year, and actually a lot of that gain has already been made and the three loading shovels to save 140,000 litres a year, and that is already in place and we've seen those benefits. So to sum up, by working on how the machines are driven, selecting the right machines for the job, and using the most modern technology in terms of hydrostatic drives, we've saved 375,000 litres of fuel at that one site alone, that's shown on the scale on the bottom. So the second case study we've picked is actually fleet optimization. And uh, this, this was a bit of a counterintuitive one for us, but the results speak for themselves. 
So we provide a full fleet of earth moving equipment to a limestone quarry in southwest England. And as well as working with Chepstow plants to supply materials to the main processing plant, this client also uses subcontract crushing to bolster their production and meet sales demand. Now they set themselves a target to reduce this third party processing cost and the associated fuel usage um, and thereby increasing 100,000 tonnes a year production through the main processing plant. So to do this, we had to look at the team of equipment that was in use on site. So we had a 50 tonne excavator working with two 45 tonne capacity rigid dump trucks, producing an annual output of 550,000 tonnes a year. This team delivered 3.9 tonnes of limestone to the crusher for every litre of fuel burned. So the findings from the site study was that we couldn't actually increase dump truck size because the primary crusher hopper was a fixed size that could not be increased. The 50 tonne excavator was working pretty much at the top end of its capacity, as was shown from the telemetry by low idle time and high fuel burn. Conversely, the dump trucks had really high idle, term, idle time due to a long loading cycle. So we felt there was an opportunity to increase production by utilizing the dump trucks on site more effectively. So the simple change was increasing the excavator to a 70 tonne class machine, working with the same two rigid dump trucks, and the output was 710,000 tonnes per year on a light for light basis. Now this equates to five tonnes of limestone moved for every litre of fuel burned. Data findings were quite interesting. So the 70 tonne excavator reduced its loading time from three minutes down to two minutes. Um, and actually, this was a bit that surprised us. We thought by going up an excavator size, we'd burn more fuel, but because the excavator being larger was working in a lot more comfortable window within its operating parameters, actually reduced the fuel burn from 42 liters per hour with the EC480 down to 40 liters per hour with the PT700 excavator. Overall, because the dump trucks were now working a little bit harder, it led to a 1% increase in fuel overall, but for a 30% increase in tonnage output, and to put that in real numbers, in 2019, fuel burn for the Logan Hall team was 141,000 litres. And in 2021, for over 100,000 tonnes more production, only burnt 142,800 litres of fuel. Now, the last case study is actually a work in progress. Now, in the previous two case studies, we've actually had solutions, whereas this one, we're still working on, so bear with us. So the two sites shown in the photographs are uh, typical sand and gravel operations with each moving around 1 million tonnes a year of soils, overburden and mineral. Site one uh, has many years left to run and all hall roads are built on solid in situ sand and gravel material. Site two is at the end of its life with all mineral exhausted and we're back in the void with overburden materials. Data taken over the last year shows an 11% increase in fuel burn at site two with the principal difference being the influence of the whole road. So as you can see, the mobile plant on site before is actually identical between the two sites. You know, same age of machines, same tiering of engines, and uh, you know, same matching of equipment. It should be noted actually that site one, site one that runs all year round is impacted by wet winter weather, whereas site two has only been on restoration work through the summer. With this in mind, in the dry summer months running on hard packed gravel roads in site one, the average fuel burn drops down to 15 litres per hour consistently. So this 11% fuel burn with site two is principally governed by the softer haul road surface, meaning that tyre is always trying to climb over a bow wave of material. This is the same effect as driving a machine up a ramp in terms of power demand from the engine. Now, if any of you have ever looked at rimple curves on your dump truck brochures, know the cat brochures have them uh, shown on the back. It shows the two main causes of engine power drain are the grade resistance or slope and the rolling resistance. And that's shown here by the diagram of this bow wave building up in front of the tire, always trying to climb out of its own rut. Now, as this is the final restoration of the second site, we are limited in what we can use to make all roads with. We are focusing on identifying stiffer clay material to use as the basis of the road, topped off with any stone or hardcore we can find to reduce the impact of the softer road surface. So yeah, sorry I haven't got any sort of definitive answers to this one, but it shows that we're constantly evolving and constantly looking at options to reduce fuel burn. So final, final section of today's presentation, Chess takes us through what's available today and what is the industry working towards for tomorrow. As has been a key theme throughout the presentation, everything at CPI starts with our data and technology platforms. Whether we're identifying training possibilities for operating improvements, or looking at asset anomalies, all three previous case studies started off by using our data and technology. 
Within this, we have two interlinked critical tools. Firstly, we'll use multiple criteria for benchmarking, whether it's by site, application, or asset type. We can clearly define improvement areas and scope out the potential sustainability impact. For instance, how many litres of fuel we save? Or how does this translate to the CO2 tonnes being produced? As an example, the first case study that Ian went through saves around about enough CO2 to effectively make our own road fleet carbon neutral. It saves around about 375 tonnes of CO2 every year. So alongside this, our technology underpins the initial studies through using large-scale data analytics and cutting-edge quarrying technology such as All Assist. For those not familiar with All Assist, it's a revolutionary onboard weighing system which produces both ourselves and our customers a granular level of detail for every dump truck cycle. By using this platform, we're able to monitor operational performance in a whole new light. For instance, we can study all different parts of a dump truck cycle, loading, unloading or travelling, to better understand productive times. We can see different load zones, where it is taking too long, or perhaps references for the distance they're travelling or the operator in the seat. Alternatively, we can look at fuel burn per cycle or carry back or time spent speeding in a part of a quarry. All of this helps us better understand the flow of material across our sites. Combining these two materials, we were able to accurately define improvement areas across the country with good level of detail as to how we can apply the information as to what we've learned. Once we know where we want to go, it's in our training and development department which really help us propel forward. Two critical areas we're heavily focusing on for long-term sustainability is our eco-operator training, such as the brake versus retarding use in the first case study, or perhaps selecting the right power mode, or could be to get them to use the live mapping function on our ADTs to control their speed and productivity. Depending on if there are other trucks waiting to be loaded, why rush back, burn more fuel, idle, and then burn more fuel while you wait to be loaded. The second area is giving our site management the tools to action these sustainability plans. Working closely with them to understand the data, trends, and opportunities we've managed to research. Without the key interaction from operators and site personnel, all of these 1%, 2% or larger improvements are all impossible to implement. After all, albeit the data can show, show us that the haul roads have pinch points or the trucks are being underfilled, without the engagement and the drive to change, we'll always fall short regardless of how good our intentions are. And finally, the alternative fuels coincide quite a bit with the, the final slide However, both HDO as an alter alternative fuel source is available now, as are hybrid excavators. These are both potentially significant steps we can take today to make quarrying more sustainable. There are several ongoing trials to assess HDO's validity, ourselves included, alongside looking at the actual environmental impact reduction of the hybrid options. One thing we always need to be mindful of, though, is looking at the total carbon footprint of these tools rather than just the end result. Albeit theoretically, HVO might reduce the CO2 emissions by 96%. It is being derived from an unsustainable resource, or it's come from deforestation in Amazon or from palm oil, perhaps over in the Far East. It's not as green an option as perhaps at first appears. And just finally, these are just some of the areas we at Chepstow we think about in future and we, where we believe the industry will continue to make significant strides forwards over the next couple of years all of which will be powerful allies in our fight towards net zero. The first is electric vehicles. These are already available uh, in the smaller machines on mini excavators or telehandlers in our industry, but are yet to make the transition across to the larger quarrying or mining machines. Next would be autonomous machines. These again are available within larger mines around the world, but are yet to be scaled down and be cost effective for use in quarrying or construction sites at the moment. And finally, this comes off the back of a lot of PR activity in the last couple of weeks, but the strides being made in hydrogen as a green alternative fuel source. This has the added bonus of using the existing internal combustion engine technologies rather than having to develop an entire new ecosystem and infrastructure for stuff like um, electric vehicles. And while some of these ideas may, may be a few years from commercial rollout, it can't be underlined enough that without competency, and with the right people for the right application, these benefits are unlikely to be fully realized. Instead, these concepts presented today 
whether they're available now or sometime in the future, will only ever be visions or goals, not the tangible targets we can all achieve. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope it's provided some valuable insights into how we at Chapter Plant approach sustainability to net zero to our technology in our sector. Um, we will be glad to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Ross and Ian, uh, for a very detailed uh, presentation with some really interesting case studies. Uh, how widely do you think those technology solutions are currently being adopted by the various industries? You know, is, is there some way to go? Is there something that we should be doing to support operators in kind of helping them make the transition across to utilising this technology to support their own sustainability goals? Um, over to you guys for, for some thoughts on that. I think um, what we found is the technology has been there for years. It's, it's not new. I remember being a quarry manager years ago and having access to various platforms. I think the difficulty is, is actually how you compile it into a, a format where you can actually use the data. It's great being able to log into a portal and actually look at this particular machine and what's it done today and what was its fuel burn and how many hours did it work and how much idle. But we actually employ someone, uh, Lady from Lisa actually, who compiles all of our data and her sole job is every Monday she pulls in all the telemetry from, you know, from Leave Air and the LIDAT system and contracts and Volvo Care Track and Finsight and pulls them all together and then spits them back out to the various sites because we might have a mix of, you know, sort of Volvo. Uh, you know, sort of bell and caterpillar equipment on a given site. So I think the difficulty is actually using the data. It's there and it's been there for a long time. It's just actually how you, you use it. And, and we've, we've just dedicated a person solely to, to looking at that. And that information gets presented to myself and all the, the regional and site managers in a format that we can use it. So I think that's the the difficulty is, is using the data that's already out there. We had a question in on autonomous electric vehicles. Ross and, and Ian, I know you touched on that towards the end of your presentation. Is there any other sort of further comment that you'd like to make about the, the likelihood of autonomous electric vehicles being utilised across the sector? Um, yeah, we, strange enough, as I had seen three, about 10 days ago with Volvo, it was one of the conversations we kept on. Um, trying to bring up, it will definitely come in. It's a question of when, not if. Um, there's a lot of questions in the hurdle still to get over, and you know, it's working out uh, how you charge them on each cycle. Um, are you going to have to plug them in? Can you charge them wirelessly? Um, there's a fun conversation over the lunchtime while we were there. How do you wirelessly charge a, a haulier when it's probably got however much muck underneath the truck where around the battery packs? Um, it, it will definitely come in. It's just um, I, it's probably still a few years away to be a commercial viable tool, I would imagine. Um, if you probably also consider all the necessary, all the relevant site upgrades you'd have to do, um, quarries aren't well known for their connectivity. Um, so you have to work with all the challenges around that. Uh, and I'm sure probably the advancements of 5G will probably help a lot with that as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's something we're keeping a very close eye on. Um, to be able to implement it whenever it is ready as a commercial offering. Um, my question is uh, for Ian, really, or, and for, for Ross from, from a Chepstow plant perspective. A um, lot of detail in your presentation today, as, as, as usual, which is great to see. Um, as you know, Ian, I'm sort of in a different part of the world now, managing an operation of about um, where we're moving 10 million tonnes of um, hard rock to four different crushes on site. So, you know, real key to, to pull into you know, the presentation you put together today. And I suppose really, what's the one key aspect that you would say that gives you the biggest synergy when you're looking at uh, your sort of movements across the UK, et cetera? Oh, biggest. Uh, and I think I alluded to it earlier, is actually having, you know, Barry, you met Lisa, um, actually having someone dedicated to, to diving into the information and pulling it all together and actually acting as a signpost because in my job I'm quite distracted you know with the various operational day-to-day -day things so I actually have two touch points with my team focusing purely on KPIs so um, on a Friday afternoon Lisa actually presents the findings to the whole operational team and we go through area by area site by site all the key performance characteristics now we don't dig down into fuel burn but we go overall productivity through the week um, uh, against our cost base. So actually having that one touch point. And then on a Tuesday afternoon, I sit down with our national ops manager and we really get into the nuts and bolts. I'm literally benchmarking that example. The third case study was benchmarking 
like for like sand and gravel operations to see well why is the fuel burn at this site constantly running at over 20 liters an hour um whereas this site is between 15 to 17 and, and you can't see any other difference between them so i think actually you know having the data is one thing but having someone package it in a way you can use it and then dedicating the time and prioritizing using it you will find these little increments and uh, and then i use that as a, a signpost for for my national ops manager who's sort of our, our man in havana who's actually out on site and he will literally go to the site and he will work with the team he'll find the reasons for the differences he will actively look at ways to to drive those improvements and and sometimes if you're looking at you know can the dump trucks do more you could be signposted as far as you can by the telemetry but you've got to get out on site and actually watch the dump trucks going around and you you know that better than anyone from your years in the industry that you've you can see all the little things that are hampering production and why the machines are not delivering what the, the sales brochures said they should be delivering. Um, but in your role as a senior, you haven't got the time to get into that detail. So having someone dedicated to doing that for you so you can then act on it, I, I think is the single biggest thing for me to actually uh, using the data successfully. Yeah, okay. So the devil is in the detail then really and, and getting out the, the boots on the ground, getting out there. And uh, yeah, so hopefully that then I think... Can the effective rolling resistance of the tyres be reduced by the use of heavy duty, reusable, temporary modular highway or recyclable geotextiles to increase the effective bearing capacity of the haul roads? Or could tyre pressures be increased on such temporary haul rolls to reduce the rolling resistance losses? We've looked at all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas. The last one we looked at, Ross and I, about a couple of weeks ago, was the, the one metre wide flotation tyres. We found a company in Denmark using these sort of thousand millimetre wide flotation tyres, but at 40 grand a truck, it was a bit, a bit expensive just for the wet winter months. Um, have used the, the, the rolling mats before, used them for crane access. They're quite good in terms of single access or like vehicle access. So cars coming into a show or a, or a large, you know, 100 or 200 tonne crane accessing a site to do a single lift. But if you're trafficking a fully loaded 30 tonne dump truck at sort of 50 to 55 tonnes or a fully loaded 40 tonne or, a, you know, 70, 75 tonnes, and, and we're running a lot of trucks, you're pounding back and forth, those mats will move over time. So you lose that sort of flat surface. Um, we've looked at a few other things, actually. We looked at a, a brick site, a brick clay site that we run in the Midlands, uh, where we struggled to run in the winter months. And it's a 500 metre long haul road, uh, double width. And we actually priced up hardcore material. And just the pure cost of recycled hardcore was £157,000. So um, you can do anything, really, but it depends on how much money you're going to throw at it. Now, we didn't go down this route because of the cost of hardcore. We've, we've looked at some other options. Um, but I think the track maps are probably best for, uh, you know, sort of sporadical one-off usage. I think if you're pounding trucks back and forth day in, day out, you know, doing sort of 150, 200 loads across the fleet per day, you, the road isn't going to last long, if I'm brutally honest.